Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for joining me this afternoon for the pelvic floor and high intensity exercise. My name is Kathleen Lombardo. I'm a physical therapist with a board certification in women's clinical specialist coming to you from the Hogue Public Health Program. So if you love high intensity exercise and yet pelvic pressure, you, the urge to urinate, pelvic heaviness, or even urine incontinence or leakage is getting in the way of your workout, then stick around for the next 20 to 30 minutes and we can shed some light on what we think is going on. So this topic is more than just about learning how to do the kegels. So this is about managing that downward pressure. So it's your legs, your core, your pelvic floor, and your overall posture and form and how they coordinate during this complex exercises so that your body can meet the forces as your foot hits the ground. So there's rebound and resiliency to support your bladder and your bowels from above. So if you're looking at that picture there, so I put that little orange shape there, that would be where your pelvic floor muscles are. So for simplicity, so you want to imagine your pelvic floor as one large trampoline system supporting your pelvic organs from impact and downward force. So the legs of the trampoline are actually your legs, right? So you need those to be strong and stable to provide adequate tension in that sling system. So we will go over how you do that in the next few slides, but for now, we're gonna go ahead and talk about the pelvic floor and its anatomy and function, just so we're all on the same page and understanding what I'm talking about, what those are and what they do. So if you look at that picture on the top left, so the pelvic floor is that red little sling at the bottom from the pubic bone to the spine. So it's this sling of muscles that has a supportive function to the organs above it. So that yellow would be your bladder, the little red one is your uterus, and the bowel would be that gray one. So you've seen from the previous picture and the one next to it, right? So as you do a jump or any high impact exercise, those muscles have to support the organs above it. Also, the muscles have a sphincteric, a sexual and stability function, meaning they they contract and relax so you can hold back gas or urine, right, when it's not appropriate to let those out. And then once we get to the bathroom, then we should be able to relax them so we can urinate or have a bowel movement without hesitancy, force, or pain. Stability function comes from the muscles being part of your core system. So what is the core? Your core is actually a cylinder. So almost always we just think about abdominal muscles as your core, but it's your back, which would be the multifidus. Your diaphragm would be the roof of it. The front is your abs, and then the bottom would be your pelvic floor muscles. So the core creates a pressure system if one wall of that cylinder fails, then the ability for that core to maintain tension and transfer forces is lost. So what we see clinically would be a manifestation of urine leakage, right? That's incontinence. So the pelvic floor to floor lost its tension. Pelvic organ prolapse, the same. The yastis, so if you're postpartum, you've maybe heard of the yastasis rectus abdominis where there's a little stretching in the abdominal area. And if it's your lower back pain, then that's the backside, right, of failure. So we'll go back to that and we'll definitely learn how to get those muscles going. But let's talk about that pressure system again. So the pressure that we keep talking about, it's a dynamic event during these high intensity exercises. So it changes with our posture, our movement mechanics, our weight and the center of gravity. So your foot, when it hits the ground, it could actually be one and a half times or up to five times the effort or five times your body weight if you're running. So that body has to manage the load over time. So the way we load and support our body impacts your performance and impacts the way it breaks down. So if you're looking at that picture on the top, so I outlined in yellow what could be going on, right? So if you have foot pronation, if you haven't heard the term pronation, that's a little bit of flattening, collapsing of your foot. 
So foot pronation, dynamic knee valgus, so a little inward angle right at the knee, hip internal rotation and adduction, so inward angle of the hip, and a pelvic drop. So all of those must be controlled when your foot hits the ground so the body can attenuate the force effectively. So think about those exercises, right? Jump squats, high knees, jump ropes, all of those things. Your lower extremity needs to be strong because it has to control um, how the pelvic floor muscles have to work in this dynamic situation. So going back to that trampoline system, so look at that. If you have good support from your legs, then there's good tension. But if there's collapsing posture in your legs leading to lost tension in your pelvic floor, which is that sling, so look at that little red you know, mark there. So if you lose tension there, then you can't create that rebound to support the viscera above, meaning your bladder, your bowels, and the result is susceptibility to pathology, which again, clinically could be pelvic pressure, just needing to urinate during those activities or leakage. So what do we do, right? So it's again about a number of exercises. We just say these are foundational exercises. So you have to do your kegels, right? Pelvic floor exercises improves pelvic organ support, reduces pelvic pressure and prevents urine leakage. You gotta work on your glutes and your core. Strong glutes and core will help support the pelvic girdle during standing, walking, loading, right? Squats, lunges, step ups, all of those fun things. It prevents the hip and knee from collapsing inwards. And if we do that, again, there's adequate tension in your pelvic floor. Arch support, that could be as simple as just supportive shoes, right? So make sure you have supportive shoes. You could even do um, some foot exercises, toe crunches, you know, towel curls, all of those things. And then you wanna be able to put them together. So integrated functional exercises, these are task specific movements that use multiple muscle groups because these exercises are fun, but they're triaxial complex movements. It's like juggling tree balls, right? You gotta learn how to control everything at the same time. All right, so we've always gotten questions on what are these exercises? So I've outlined a little bit of what those are. And by no means is this, you know, one size fits all, but a guide um, as to some of the common exercises that we give out in the clinic. So it's a mixture of things where, you know, we're doing our core. Some of it would be that bridge or isometrics or that bicycle, dead bugs we call them in the clinic, bare plank, full plank, modified plank. And for glutes, we do a mixture of things where your feet are on the ground or they're off the ground. So we have sideline leg lifts, you could do a squat, single leg balancing. Again, when you're balancing on one leg, your glute actually has to turn on, meaning your butt, right? You're squeezing your butt so that your pelvis doesn't drop on the other side. So you're keeping a, an even pelvis there. And then doing some leg extensions on your hands and knees, side plank, fire hydrants, and bridges again. And then we always want to do integrative exercises. So what that means is that we're training and using multiple muscle groups and adding maybe trunk resistance exercises for perturbation and control of your pelvis over your leg, over your femur. So it's one thing to do leg exercises in the air, right? But if you're gonna plant, jump, step up, all of those things, you need to control your pelvis over your leg and your pelvis is actually that socket for that hip joint, and then your pelvic floor lives in there too. So on that top picture, it's a little bit of a pre-run you know, exercise, and if I add that little band around my trunk, then that provides a little spin that I have to resist during those activities, so I can train myself to control over my leg. We like to do core exercises, but introduce upper extremity, meaning arm movements, right? With using a reciprocal motion um, and a feed forward rotation and movement of the arms because your deep abdominal, so your transverse abdominus, actually works with a synergy of your trunk rotators 
and you gotta introduce posture, awareness, breathing, all of that stuff. So it's not, when you do the core, it's not so much just a corset type of exercise, but it's turning it on before an arm movement. So it's a feed forward muscle. I like to use a tall kneel or a half kneel as a precursor. So if standing lunges, all of those things are a little bit difficult, then I'll break it down and use a half kneel because um, that is similar you know, to a lunge. And in that position, I can get my glutes to fire. I can inhibit my hip flexors if I'm tight and my quads and my hips there. Um, I like to use that. And again, adding arm work accentuates some of the slings um, in my back and my trunk. And then we have the bridge again, adding some arm movements and then our multi-directional lunges. So you gotta do all of these as prep work um, to get your legs strong, your core strong. And then we'll now come back to our pelvic floor, right? I think it would be a disservice not to talk about how to do a Kegel. Um, so how do we do a Kegel? So I wanna make sure we touch base, you know, and walk away here knowing how to do that. So let's revisit where those muscles are. So the picture here is now looking at you if you were on a table, an exam table with your legs bent. Um, the top part there would be your pubic bone and then your tailbone and your hip sockets there side to side. So all that red that lives in the middle would be your pelvic floor. So you can practice with me if you like. We're gonna just try and do a Kegel here. So think about squeezing your muscles like you're stopping the flow of urine and gas from coming out. And then imagine there's a zipper starting from your anus or your rectum and closing it up to the vaginal canal up to your pubic bone into the urethra. And then draw that sensation back to the labia and pull that sensation up and inwards like inside of you in the vaginal canal about a milliliter and then you're gonna to have to breathe. <laughs> so that is a Kegel. So again, so we'll start, so what it would be is you take an inhale to prepare, and then on the exhale, you're gonna squeeze like stopping gas and urine from coming out, bring the labia together, pull it up and in, and draw that sensation inside of you about a milliliter, and hold, and breathe. And that would be a Kegel. And we're gonna do different vari variations of that, um, but that is how you do a Kegel. All right, now we're gonna integrate that Kegel into your core, right? So we said your pelvic floor is part of your core, and during these core exercises, you wanna be able to activate all of those muscles. So how do we do that? So you're gonna inhale to prepare. Now you know how to do a Kegel. You're gonna Kegel, and then you're gonna pull your belly button in and up as you exhale and lightly tighten the stomach muscles. And now you really gotta think of pressure away from the pelvic floor. So imagine there's a wire pulling your hip bones together. And then imagine that you're lengthening your spine to activate your back muscles, your multifidi. And then you're gonna breathe. So go ahead and relax. So if you put your hands above your hip bones and sink your fingers in, when you contract your transverse abdominis, you should feel a tensioning away from your fingers. So I'm kegeling and then I'm pulling my abs away from my fingers, but very important to think about those pressures as moving away from the pelvis. So going up towards your head, exhaling air out. So we like to exhale. People ask us why we do an exhale because your diaphragm and your pelvic floor have a rhythm. So when your diaphragm comes down on the inhale, so it pushes the pelvic floor down. And when you exhale, your diaphragm comes up and your pelvic floor should naturally come up. So we'll practice this one more time. So you're gonna inhale to prepare. And then you're gonna kegel and exhale, pull the belly button in and up thinking about tensioning your hip bones together and lengthening your spine and keep breathing and relax. So if I were to do my core exercises, so if I were to add you know, an arm movement, then what I would do is I'm exhaling, activating all of that, and then moving my arm. Remember, it's a feed forward, it has to turn on, 
blow before you go is what we talk in the physical therapy world. We say exhale, pull it in, and then move your arm. So that is what your core should do. All right. So, uh, you know, just a quick note that muscles are not just for shortening. Uh, muscles also need to lengthen. So it has two purposes, right? So it has to produce movement and then lengthen to allow for movement. So important that you got to think about a range of motion. Again, thinking back to that trampoline, it's not just about tension. It has to go up, it has to come down, it has to have elasticity and rebound and not just be like a tight closed fist all day long, right? So what you strengthen, you got to stretch. If you contract, you got to relax fully. All right, so a proper Kegel is a full pelvic floor contraction followed by a full relaxation. So what does an exercise program look like just for the pelvic floor? I said we were gonna do a variety of them. So here it is. So the first one would be quick Kegels. We just contract, relax, contract, relax, contract, relax. So they're reflexive. We do that because our pelvic floor muscles have some muscles that are fast twitch, we call them like sprinters, right? You need to react if you cut, plant, um, change directions really quickly. And then the next one would be slow kegels. So you hold it for 10 seconds and then you fully relax for 10 seconds. So those are more postural endurance type kegels, right? If you're gonna support your organs, you actually need endurance. So for those two, you're gonna do two sets of 10, right? daily so most of our patients you know when they come in we say do 10 quick do 10 slow and do it twice a day and then if you're gonna do high intensity exercise we like introducing elevator kegels we call them what that is is on that exhalation you're going to contract your pelvic floor thinking of going up about five floors so I'm inhaling to prepare and then exhaling i'm going to go up to the first floor second third fourth fifth hold it and then I'm gonna go down, four, three, two, one, maybe even the basement, and then do 10 repetitions of those. So what that does is you're shortening and lengthening through a range of motion. Again, for high impact exercises, it's not just it's on or off. You need to have that control through a range, up and down, inhaling and exhaling, and being able to work through that range. And then functional kegels, we've talked about, it's part of your core. So these muscles need to be um, on with exhalation, on with your core, on before some movements, all right? And then don't over-exercise. Um, these muscles can be also too tight, like we said, you know, like holding a tight fist all the time. And we always get this question, you know, are kegels for everyone? And the short answer is no. So not everybody, you know, needs to do kegels necessarily. I mean, it's good, but in the clinic, so the long answer is that <clears throat> some of our patients or our athletes can actually come in and they're over-reliant on their pelvic floor as a form of stability. So we would, you know, liken this to somebody who's quad dominant, right? So if you're performing your squat, you're quad dominant, you're not gonna necessarily train their quads to be stronger. You're looking at why am I quad dominant? What else can I do? And what's wrong with the form and why, you know, I'm always going to that muscle group. So it's more than that. And the signs would be, you know, maybe you have pelvic pain, painful intercourse. Some of the urgency can sometimes be because you're overly tight in your pelvic floor. Um, new onset of back pain or hip pain. So if you have that, or if you're doing your kegels and you notice that these, you know, pains are coming up, then that's a sign maybe, you know, maybe you're overly tight in your pelvic floor and that's a whole different presentation. So <laughs> I would say, you know, just discontinue and then come see a specialist if you're needing help in that area. All right, so just as a summary, so if there's an imbalance in either direction, right, so proper rehab will result in more functional movement and decreased likelihood for injury. So just make sure you get that checked out. All right, so some of the fun things, right, we want to just give you some tips. We talked about form and posture. So if we're looking at a jump squat or high knees, so do a posture check. So don't crush the canister we talk about. The canister meaning your core, we had that cylinder image, right? So if you're doing a high knee or jump squat, you don't wanna be crunching down. So you wanna keep your cylinder 
straight and not crush it and work through your hip range, right? You're bringing your knees up. Land lightly, toes forward, arms swing up on the jump, land beneath your center of mass and exhale on landing. So we're training our pelvic floor muscles to turn on on exhale. So if you breathe and practice on exhaling on landing, then hopefully you could manage that impact. All right, jump rope, double unders, again, posture check, right? So don't crush the canister. Land gently and absorb impact through your ankles and your knees. Keep your core engaged. So you're looking at where are my ribs? So make sure your ribs are stacked over your pelvis, preventing rib flare. So when you're doing jump and you're holding, you know, that jump rope, typically when you're pull, you know, doing it's going up over your head your rib tends to flare and what that does is it ruins that core cylinder system so keep your pelvis ribs over your pelvis um, keep your pelvis from forward tilting or back tilting chin down lengthen your neck um, move the jump rope using your wrists and try to keep your elbows locked against your sides breathe through your diaphragm and don't hold your breath and some other tips here and that your jump rope length should reach the armpit to nipple line when you're standing in the middle of the jump rope. So just, you know, how to measure it. We get the question, you know, am I consciously kegling each time I land? Not necessarily. I think that is very difficult and nobody could really do that. The idea is we're training your pelvic muscles to have a rhythm with your breath. So you're not necessarily you know, consciously contracting it. It should just naturally turn on. All right, and abdominals. So all of these exercises typically come, you know, your planking, plank row, or you know, some variation of that. So if you have to do a sit up, you wanna think of pulling up lead with your belly button instead of again crunching and crushing the canister that keeps the pressure off of your pelvic floor keep your trunk long for a plank or a push-up you want to also squeeze your glutes so it's not just about the abs so exhale and squeeze your glutes if i'm starting from the bottom right so my belly off of the ground first and then on the way down, my chest touches first. Just keeping that in mind keeps your trunk in alignment instead of overextending or arching your back. Dead bugs is what we call it in the clinic, or that's that bicycle, you know, where you're alternating bicycle with your legs. Just watch that your lower back is not overarching and exhale with each leg extension. Breathe to manage pressure, exhale on effort, pelvic floor and abdominals prior to exertion. Running, be mindful not to overstride. So people that actually have longer strides, that places excessive force on your legs, lower extremity, it's LE, that is translated up through your pelvis. So the shorter your steps with a higher turnover, um, it's actually more beneficial. But you wanna make sure that your impact, yes, you're shortening your step and your foot hits the ground a little bit more, but you wanna manage that impact. Think of leaning into the run as if you're catching yourself from falling. Don't fight the run. Pelvic floor should naturally contract at foot strike to help absorb the shock and then relax during the flight phase. Again, not consciously contracting, but use your breathing technique to try and get those in. All right. Um, warm up cool down and stretch so don't forget those are all important um, yes you want to build strength meaning capacity want to work on balance and control but also flexibility modifying during your pregnancy we're looking at you know modifying positions and weight being careful with anything that um, puts you off balance a little bit. So your center is different, so being careful. Definitely get OB clearance. Consider these questions, right? Can I versus should I? And always the what ifs. Um, but not to say exercise is great during pregnancy. We encourage it. Um, labor is hard work and it's actually an athletic event. So you wanna be nice and strong for that and have pelvic floor awareness. But you also wanna be very careful and cautious. And then postpartum, so we see a lot of um, patients, you know, progressing back into exercise postpartum. So usually you'll get your clearance at six to eight weeks postpartum, 
begin with just diaphragmatic breathing, focusing on the belly, lower rib expansion, start your Kegel program, right? Regain your strength and motor control. Begin your foundational exercises, stretch posture exercises. So in pregnancy and postpartum, if you've delivered vaginally, then obviously that's a stretch to your pelvic floor. Your belly is stretched, right, from being pregnant. So you wanna try and get those muscles back in shape. Your glutes, it's not as obvious, but your pelvis actually widens a little bit. Your glutes get a little weaker as it supports, you know, the changes during pregnancy. So all of those muscles, you should do these foundational exercises, rehab them, get used to moving again, and you can start with some modified workouts in a class setting. So instead of doing a jumping jack, right, you could do sidestep with arm lifts, or instead of doing a squat jump, you could squat and punch, right, to start with. Instead of a full plank, you could do bear plank or knee planks. And instead of a full push-up, you could do wall or knee push-ups. And then work your way up. So just take your time. We say about three to four months returning to running, heavier lifting, jumping, all of these exercises. Just because it takes about eight weeks to actually develop you know, good muscle strength. So that's where we get that number. Signs of intolerance, if you have abdominal bulging or doming, inability to maintain the tension at that linea alba, which is that diastasis area. Any rotation, too much rotation if that pelvis or rib cage rotation, it's good if you're running. But if you're doing something static, any, you know, um, too much rotation in there. Pressure belly, arching of your lower back, pain, breath holding, pelvic pressure, urgency, incontinence. If you have any of those, those are signs of intolerance, meaning just not that you can't do it, but just take a pause and go back to some of the basics and then modify and then go back to trying to do those exercises. So I think that's it for now. I hope that was helpful. The take home is that the pelvis is in the middle of your body. So you don't just need to train your pelvic floor, but you're looking at control from the bottom up and the top down um, so that you can have proper support, rebound, elasticity, resiliency in that pelvic floor to support the organs above. So we'll go ahead and take some questions. I hope you learned something. Uh, someone is asking if uh, they could have a copy of the slides. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the question is if we could provide a copy of the slides, and yes. Could you tell them to please email communityed at hogue.org? Okay, so email communityed at hogue.org, and, 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 and then we'll get you the slides, yeah. I think that's it. All right, thanks for joining. Like an abdominal sit up. So the yeah. question is explain how to proper sit up. I'm guessing it's an abdominal sit up, not sitting. Yeah. I can ask. Yeah. Yeah. And I might have to get on the ground. I'm thinking yes, it's an yes, abdominal it's sit-up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to demo for the sit-up. Am I okay here? But no, down here? No, I can't see it. Yeah, that's okay. Stay there. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So for an abdominal sit-up, so what I'm saying, is you don't want to do this so you don't want to curl up so what you're looking for is you're keeping the trunk long and you're thinking about going up this way so if you have one of those plates it helps you know if you have a plate thinking about you have a plate here and you don't want to spill it whatever's on it and then you're offering it up 
So you're not going to go as far. If you're strong, I'm not that strong. If I'm strong, I could probably go all the way up. But you want to not do this. So you want to do a little bit more of that. When you see, please repeat the question, when you see a pelvic floor patient, do you check their PFM vaginally to make sure they are doing correctly versus patient feeling the lift? So the question is, when we see a patient in the clinic, do we check the pelvic floor muscles vaginally? Typically, yes. So that is standard. So if a patient consents, then when a patient comes in, we do go in vaginally, so we're all right, wash hands, glove, lubricate, we go in vaginally and ask the patient to do a Kegel, and that's how we know if they're doing it correctly or not. Um, if the patient is not comfortable, sure, I mean, we have other ways. We can touch, you know, in the perineum from the external and see if they're able to do it or just visually see it. But the standard and the best way to do it is to examine vaginally. Because if you're actually doing it correctly, nobody should know, right? You, should, you could be <laughs> sitting um, in a waiting room and just doing it, and nobody should know. So, yes. Okay. Now I think we're good. All right. Thanks, everybody.